We are approaching the book, the end of the book of James. And here James gets fairly basic, giving simple pastoral advice. If you're suffering, pray. If you're cheerful, sing praises. If you're sick, call for the elders. Very simple, direct advice. But as with so much which we find in the word of God, it's profound. So let's ponder each three. So if anyone's suffering, they should pray. That, of course, doesn't mean you can pray when you're happy, but in particular, if you're suffering, prayer is a good thing. And by suffering here in James chapter 5, 13, James is focusing on being in trouble, enduring hardship, having toil, something grievous that is affecting you in your life. Now, let's state the obvious. This is unpleasant. Suffering is unpleasant. And it shows two things, that we are sinners, and we also live in a fallen world. It shows us that something is wrong in that creation God created originally very good. And it can be painful, not just physically and emotionally and mentally, but spiritually. Suffering can sometimes expose childish beliefs we have. And it can even expose false faith, as we read in the parable of the sower. Now, this unfortunate thing, the suffering, can also be a good thing. Because it can bring strength to a believer to be able to go through suffering and remain faithful is a great sign of the Holy Spirit. It can make one more mature by, again, the Lord pointing out weaknesses in what we believe. It can also be a mercy for the church when unbelievers or tares are exposed in her midst. So suffering can, can strengthen churches and individuals. And remember, that's been James's actually main purpose. We remember way back in James chapter 1, verse 2, 3, he gave us the description of why he was writing this epistle. And he wrote, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that testing of your faith produces endurance. So you got to have both. You admit you know, trials and suffering are a bad thing, but you also admit in faith the Lord is doing something. Because suffering will cause the faithful to turn to God in prayer and then in worship. And it's really an act of faith. You know, when something comes on you and you're like, oh, Lord, this is horrible. Help me. What an amazing thing of faith. And you cling to those promises we have throughout Scripture. Just, just to give you one example, Psalm chapter 50, verse 15. Call on me in the day of trouble. I shall rescue you. And you will honor me. You notice the hope, the promise, but you notice also the faith. And so during times of suffering is a wonderful opportunity to work on prayer. And again, let me read you that wonderful definition of prayer from the catechisms. Prayer is an offering up of our desires unto God for things agreeable to his will. In the name of Christ, by the help of his spirit, with confession of our sins and thankful acknowledgement of his mercies. So prayer in one sense is very simple, but let's think about prayer this day and age. You know, let's think about what we should pray and how we should pray. The first thing I would encourage you to think about when it comes to prayer is to remember the direction and do not confuse the direction. Prayer is us to God. The direction of prayer is us to God. And we hear that in the creed, and we hear that throughout Scripture. Prayer is an offering up of our desires unto God. This is the normal means by which we speak to God. So this is how we speak to our Heavenly Father. Now, pretty, please note, if you hear nothing in your prayers, you're not doing anything wrong. You know, some people will have senses in their life, they hear a voice. I think once in my life I actually heard, I thought an audible voice of God speaking. But if you hear nothing in your prayers, you're not doing anything wrong. Because it's you talking to God. And the key thing about, heavenly, about biblical prayer is your heavenly Father is listening. Now, if you do hear things in your prayers, that can be a good thing. 
But be careful. You need to test that and test it by Scripture. Because Scripture has the final authority. But again, the normal way we speak to God is in prayer. The normal way God speaks to us, the other direction, of course, is the ministry of the word. What we're doing here now, when we hear the scriptures read, when the Bible is exposited, is explained, his law and gospel is rightly divided, his gospel is proclaimed, and we receive it in the sacraments. It is in the preaching of the word and the administration of the sacraments that is how God speaks to us, especially on the Lord's Day. But back to prayer. There is great freedom in prayer. Again, prayer is an offering up of our desires. Those desires, not just correct things, but desires unto God. And there's actually very few limitations to prayer. All too often, we overcomplicate prayer to be blunt, especially preachers. I've done this before in the past and have had to repent for it. We like adding special rules. You have to pray for so long or be in this emotional state or this posture. We add things on. Scripture does not add to. But prayer is meant to be simple. I mean, just thinking of the example we have in the gospel. Someone asked the Lord Jesus how to pray, and what was his response? Well, say this, and then he gave the Lord's Prayer. So if you don't know how to pray, when in doubt, pray the Lord's Prayer. And by the way, we also have a large collection of prayers in Scripture. The largest book in the Bible is the Book of Psalms. You have 150 prayers to pray if you don't know how to pray. And we read in Romans 8, even our groanings, if they're done in faith in Christ, are acceptable unto the Lord. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Christ, help me. That's acceptable unto the Lord. Because we can turn over all our concerns, all our fears, all our joys unto God. Because he's a loving father and he wants to hear his children. Remember when your children were really young and they would come to you and they would tell you anything. And even the little things that might scare them, you'd want to hear. Because you love your children just as God the Father loves us in Christ. And how much more so in times of trouble. When we're under distress or under affliction, we cry out to God. We can also, by the way, be very blunt and honest with God. And you see that throughout Scripture. You see Moses' great prayer in Numbers. He gets so frustrated leading Israel. He actually prays for death. Oh, Lord, just kill me. Why have you given me these people? Now, of course, he doesn't commit suicide. That would be a sin. But he's so frustrated, he turns that over to the Lord. Think of Job. How many times has Job complained throughout that huge book? What, 42 chapters? But Job is called a righteous man in that great prayer. I think it's in 17 or 19 where Job says, I have two things, Lord, during his time of travail. Stop it. Why? You read through the Psalms, especially the middle Psalms, and sometimes they sound like almost an atheist praying. Just give you one example. In the middle of Psalm 77, verses 7 through 9, will the Lord reject forever? And will he never be favorable again? Has his loving kindness ceased forever? Has his promises come to an end forever? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Or, uh, or has he in his anger withdrawn his compassion? That's scripture. That's an example of biblical prayer. Now, you can't stay there. You have to go read the ending. But you notice there's still faithfulness there while the psalmist is like, Lord, where are you? Let alone, of course, the most famous, simple, grievous prayer is the prayer of the Lord Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane where he prays not to go to the cross, which is extraordinary. So there's great freedom in prayer. You can open up your hearts and you can turn over all your desires unto the Lord. Yes, there's a few limitations. As we hear in the catechism, for things agreeable to his will in the name of Christ. You cannot, of course, blaspheme God and mock God when you pray. He will not tolerate that. It's a direct violation of the third commandment. And you, can, and you shouldn't pray against any. You should not pray for things which are against his revealed will. You know, you can't pray for things that are directly forbidden. You know, the Ten Commandments, Christ, two great laws, love God, love your neighbor. 
you know, oh Lord, please murder all my enemies. Please Lord, I want to steal and be successful. Those are not good prayers. So you can't pray something that's contrary to the law. But however, you can turn over those desires. Again, the Lord Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane is so extraordinary. He is God. Talk about someone who technically didn't need prayer, but he prayed all the time because he's fully man and fully God. And he prayed not to go to the cross, which he knew was his main purpose. But of course, it makes it a, a correct and godly prayer with that ending. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Oh Lord, I really, really want that golden Corvette, and I really want to maybe go rob a bank and steal money. Oh, Lord, have mercy on my soul. I know that's wrong, Lord. Help me, Lord. I do need transportation, but not my will, yours be done. That's okay. There's great freedom, but it has to be also in the name of Christ. It is only through Christ we are made right with God. We are made a child of God. We are made our friend of God. It is only by the covering of the blood of Christ that God hears our prayers. And so therefore we are to pray in the name of Christ. But when you pray in the name of Christ, that's a sure sign the Holy Spirit is with you and in you. You know, you're just crying out like the psalmist did in Psalm 77. But, you know, you're saying, Lord, are you out there? Have you forgotten me? Help me, Lord. Give me mercy. Oh, but, Lord, thy will be done. Keep me faithful in Christ. That is a sure sign God is with you. That is a sure sign with the Holy Spirit's upon you. As I've said many times, when parishioners come to me, I'm like, Pastor, I'm struggling. I'm really wrestling with sin. I'm really wrestling with this particular thing. I'm trying to rest in Christ. I'm like, wow, the Holy Spirit's upon you greatly. Because there's that conviction and the desire to trust in Christ. Yes, you have to repent. Yes, you have to do what's right. But the struggle and remain faithful is a sign that God is with you, that you are being helped by his spirit, as again we read in the catechism. And my, that's encouraging. It's the person who doesn't care that I'm concerned about. Yeah, whatever. Very dangerous. Finally, it's appropriate to have a laundry list in my younger days, I used to preach against this, you know, don't have a laundry list of things. It's okay to turn over your desires under God. Lord, here's a list, boom, boom, boom. Again, like a little child going to his heavenly father. But do remember, there are other parts of prayer. And do try to work those in. Work in that confession of sin. Okay, Lord, I'm being greedy. Help me in my greed. I repent of that. Help me not be greedy. And also remember Thanksgiving to thank your heavenly Father for what he has done. Thank you, Lord, you who are three in one. So if you're having trouble, if you're in distress, pray. But what happens if things are going well and you're happy? Well, Scripture says, sing praises. And the word happy here in James 5.13 is to be cheerful, to be encouraged, to be in good spirits. And James here calls us to sing in that case. And by the way, that, isn't that easy? Even people who are not musical, like I'm very not musical. I'm um, very not musical. And, you know, you get happy and you sing a little tune in your mind or even out loud. It's a beautiful thing to have that joy bubbling up. And I know yesterday my wife was singing at the house, and it was good to hear. She was happy and she was singing. And that's a beautiful thing. Even the strange songs my daughter sings from her generation, teenagers and her music. You know how that is. But James, in particular, has a type of song in mind. It's not some generic song. Yes, there's times for okay, secular songs, as long as they're not blasphemous. But here he commands to sing praises. And let me give you the hyper-literal translation of this. Is anyone cheerful? If anyone, is anyone cheerful? Let him psalm. Now, we usually use the word psalm as a noun. It's only a noun in English. It's a song of praise. But I love it in Greek, it's also a verb. You know, let him psalm, let him sing praises. That word sing praises there literally is psalm. And of course, psalm has two meanings. In the broad sense, it's any spiritual song that's godly. So to sing a psalm in the broadest sense, to sing praises unto God is to sing any great Christian song, any Orthodox Christian song. But of course, in the narrow sense, it refers to those 150 psalms 
in the book of Psalms, which we've started to sing now as middle hymns occasionally, which is a good thing. And by the way, this is a good practice to sing Christian songs. You know, and when it comes to your own private singing, sing whatever you want. You know, if, if you're into Christian metal and that's what you enjoy, fine, and your own private singing, that's okay. Personally, I think the older hymns are better because they're a little more theologically solid. But especially on the Lord's Day, we're called to come together in that sweet hour of prayer and sing together. And that's why we sing, because it's commanded. And by the way, for those people who don't like to sing, you should sing. And I'm one of those guys, I hate singing because I have a horrible voice. I'm a guy. It bothers me. There is no reason why you should not sing in, in the house of the Lord. Well, I'm a terrible singer, so. Question, if you had a really good earthly father, you know, a father who was a very good father, and he went to his birthday party, and they started singing happy birthday, and you decided not to sing, what does that make you look like? You're just singing happy birthday, come on. And who are you singing it to? Your father. How much more so than your heavenly father? On his day, to sing unto his glory. We are here not to be professional, though it's good to have a very professional choir to help us, we are here to sing on the Lord, so you should sing. And that is a glorious thing to do. So, and by the way, there are good psalms, sorry, psalters that you can pick up, and I can give you some suggestions. I think they're in your sermon notes that put the psalms to hymns you know, so you can learn to sing the word of God, which is a beautiful thing. So if you're in distress, pray. If you're in times of joy, sing praises, but what happens if you have illness? If anyone is sick, James says, call for the elders, and they will pray over the person and anoint him with oil. Here, sickness in James 5.14 refers to being ill, to be weak, to be weary of mind or body. It's illness, it's sickness. Now, there's a place certainly for individual prayer. The Lord Jesus prayed frequently by himself. We should pray those kind of prayers. But however, we in the modern church have a very weak view of the church. It's one of the great besetting sins of the modern evangelical church. We think the church is an optional extra. We think it's a social club. It is not. It is Christ's spiritual body on earth. And the church alone has the power to bind people to heaven or loose them unto judgment. As we read in our first scripture reading, the disciples have that power. And the church has that power. And we have the great keys. The church has the great keys of the gospel, which alone the church proclaims, which binds people to heaven. And the other key, which is church discipline, to correct its members, and if necessary, excommunicate the false believers. And we read in, in scriptures, throughout scripture, a local church is to be governed by godly, mature men, called elders or overseers or whatever you want to call them. But they're called to shepherd, to guide, and to correct the saints. They're called to pastor. Yes, there are pastors which specialize in teaching and preaching, and they are part of the elder board. But the elders are men who govern this church. And you notice it's not just governing, it's not just teaching, but it's also pastor to shepherd. And here, if anyone's sick, they are to call the elders, and the elders are to pray over them. It's interesting, it's not the deacons. You know, the deacons would come and bring you food and help you maybe cut your lawn if you're sick. But the ones who show up and pray, and by the way, anyone can pray over with anyone. It's not, you can do that. But the ones who are called to pray over in a special way are the elders. And do we think of a church like that? That's what scripture commands. But you might ask me, well, wait a minute, Doug. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, that's all good. Church, elders praying. What's up with this oil part? Let's ponder that for a second. Now, anointing with oil, olive oil, by the way, it was common in the ancient world. This is a common practice throughout Old and New Testament. It's common in Scripture. Of course, we don't do it anymore in the modern world. But for the ancients, like, oh, yeah, this is normal. And it signifies something special. When you anoint someone with oil, it's signifying that something special is happening or something special will happen. When we read in Scripture, there's a, actually a special oil used for the tabernacle and the temple in the Old Testament. It was used for special worship and for consecration of things. And actually, there's a recipe for this special oil that's in Scripture. It's in Exodus chapter 30. But for more mundane things, like someone's house, they would simply use olive oil. 
Now, again, this anointing in the Old Testament was set apart. It was to set something or some person or some place apart for special service. Whether it's a place, whether it's an offering, or even the priest, they'd be anointed with this olive oil. And we have examples of also of prophets and kings being anointed. It's a sign also that mourning has ceased, and it's time to focus on doing something, on living. Think in the Old Testament. David's son is about to die, his little baby, and he prays passionately that the Lord save his child. The child dies, and then David does this. This is 2 Samuel 12, 20. So David arose from the ground, washed, anointed himself, and changed his clothes, and he came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he came to his own house, and when he requested, they set food before him, and he ate. It's an amazing thing of faith. For days he would not eat. He would just, he was praying, just weeping on the Lord, to the Lord to give his child mercy. And in God's good time, he decided not to. And therefore, when that was revealed, David reacted in faith. And you notice this part of getting, just going back and living in life. He anointed himself with oil. Because there's absolutely a time to mourn. But there's a time also to move on. Lest you do not live for the Lord. But on a more cheerful note, think of that great psalm, Psalm 23, everyone's favorite psalm. How does it end? Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. My enemies surround me, but yet he sets a table. Thou anointest my head with oil. God is promising blessing. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Even though his enemies surround me, the Lord has me feast and anoints my head with oil. So for James in the early church, anointing was a common thing. They're like, sure, why not? So you might ask me, why don't we do this custom? Well, we don't necessarily do it, but be careful here. If the response is we don't do it because, well, it just doesn't fit with modern times, you know, being hit with Western oil seems kind of weird, you're not thinking right. That would be foolish and ungodly. The reason why we've stopped this tradition is in our Protestant heritage is the New Testament commands freedom from ceremonial laws. You read that in Romans 14 about the mature believer turns away from Old Testament ceremonial practices. We read in Galatians 3 that we're free from the ceremonial law. Now, there's nothing wrong with using oil. But if you're focused on the oil, you're doing it wrong. If you're all focused, like, oh, I need the oil because it's magical, you're doing it wrong. The focus is trusting in Christ and his church and prayer and faith. So again, there's really nothing wrong with using oil. And it's probably something we should consider doing. And again, not as some fancy, strange ritual, but if someone's really sick, call for the elders, call for the pastor, and they'll come and pray over you. And by the way, if you are sick, please do call me. And you know, if you want oil, I'll bring oil. But you notice, though, the elders are praying in the name of the Lord. That's the key thing. It's offered up in faith, and that's a powerful thing because you notice the promise in James 5.15. They will be restored, it will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And, and if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven of him. Now, could God miraculously heal someone? How many of us have had prayers answered we didn't think would be answered? And we modern Christians, I think, are sometimes way too afraid to think supernaturally. I know, I confess I do that sometimes. We should trust in the Lord, and the Lord does give mercy and kindness to his people. The Lord does answer prayers. But not always, as we read in the case of David. Either way, the response should be faith. And you see that in James, because you notice he actually focuses on something far greater than mere physical healing, though again, physical healing is a good thing. He did not write, but he will heal you, but will restore you. And it's interesting, that word restore is literally where we get the word save. We read in the ESV the same verse, and the prayer of faith will save 
the one who is sick. Maybe God will save them physically in this life, but you notice what the assurance is, is in the next. That the faith of a person who is sick will be strengthened. Keep on reading the verse. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. You notice, he might still die. But what's the promise? At the resurrection of the end of the age, he will go into the glories of heaven and all his sins will be forgiven. Do you see the focus? Because it shows faith at full work. Remember, I've argued throughout this sermon series, James is actually about faith and faith in action. Can you imagine if you knew someone that had the following things. He was a good and active member in a solid, biblically-based church. He becomes sick, and he calls for the elders of the church to come and pray and to anoint him in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to lay hands and pray over him. Trusting in God, whatever may come, if he passes with his last breath, he praises God. And if he's restored, he, he gets up and he praises God for being healed and returns back to worship. What would you call that person? Faithful. That's some real Christian faith. And that's what James is driving at. So James' pastoral advice in these three verses is very simple. Oh, but it's profound. The Lord is merciful. He hears us when we pray, especially in times of distress. To quote Psalm 18.6, In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried to my God for help. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry for help before him came into his ears. Oh, the Psalms are beautiful. God also hears us when we're joyful, when we sing. We sing songs unto him. As a Paul writes in Ephesians, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. We do this as individuals. We should do this as families. And especially we should do it on the Lord's Day as we gather in his church and praise God that he has given us his church where we can be trained, where we can re where we receive correction, where we can be encouraged, where we can feed on his word. Again, we gather together and it's pleasing the Lord that we pray unto him, that we sing unto him, and that's us, him. But it is here and only here you hear him speak to you for the preaching of the word and the administration of the sacraments, of that law that cuts deep and that gospel that fills up with such power. And he's even so merciful, he gives us visual aids to remind us who we are in him. That his body has been broken for us. His blood has been shed for us, which covers us, which anoints us and makes us his. So let us go to the Lord's table and let us rejoice and taste his kindness. Amen.